our next speaker is even livelier than Marie Antoinette. I remember about 10 years ago going to a dinner party in my native London and feeling as if I'd been struck by lightning. Um, in fact, I'd simply been seated to the left of Carolyn Sargentson, um, a person of incredible energy, bubbling with ideas, even as she always keeps a close eye on the objects she studies. Carolyn was installed for nearly 20 years at the V&A, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and specializes, of course, in the study of 17th and 18th century furniture. Back in 1996, she published a truly groundbreaking study on merchants and luxury markets in 18th century Paris. This was a book that dealt not just with objects, but with the public experience of shopping. And I think it's a, an area which um, Carolyn can really be regarded as a, as a pioneer. Um, she was rewarded it has to be said, for that extraordinary achievement some years later by being made head of research. And I think it's worth saying that Carolyn has done as much as anyone I know to encourage the study of the, of the decorative arts um, and sculpture, something that is obviously very close to the interests of, of my own department. She's now working on a multi-volume catalogue of the French furniture in the V&A's collection. Um, and I'm pleased to say that having left the V&A um, officially three years ago, she's just been appointed senior lecturer um, and in the history of art at the University of Sussex back in Britain. She's going to talk with, I know, typical écran with about reading, writing and röntgen. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Luke. Um, London's greatest recent export, I think. The Met is very lucky to have him. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much. Um, my job today is to talk to you not directly about Röntgen's furniture, but to skirt around him, to look at some of the questions of why his furniture mattered quite so much. And I'm going to talk specifically about Paris, um, a very, very important market for his furniture that as Wolfram has so carefully and cleverly explored, um, travelled from Neuwied in those rather amazing crates. And what I want to do is to talk this afternoon of some of the context into which that furniture was inserted in Paris, in which it was desired, in which it was acquired, and in which it was operated, perhaps not every day, but repeatedly during the course of its life in a particular room, in a particular hotel particulier or in a palace, we, you know, variable um, destinations to which it went. Um, the way I want to do that is to focus on what I call the culture of writing and the art of writing, which is something that is rather lost to us these days. And you may bear that in mind as we see um, unfolding in the lecture the various techniques that people had to develop to, de to develop real skill levels in their own lives in writing and reading, and indeed in operating the furniture. And I'd like you to bear in mind the themes of politics, intrigue, and love as we go through the next 45 minutes or so, because these themes will reoccur, um, and they will be functioning, if you like, and mobilized within the operation of the furniture. Now, I want to start with a piece that Wolfram just showed you of 1769, Abraham Röntgen's Poudreurs, a combined writing and dressing table. And although it's fantastic marquetry, and there's no doubt that the elaborate mounts are also um, very beautifully designed and executed, it's a relatively unassuming piece. So I want to show you bit by bit how it unfolds using another of the Met's rather wonderful animations. So the way in is through this gilt brass escutcheon. This is what points the way. This is the entrance, the open sesame moment. When you look at a piece of furniture, you're going to be drawn by the decorative qualities of that sparkling gilded brass to imagine how you might get into it and start to work it. And I'm going to show you it unfolding. So you've seen these kinds of things before in um, Wolfram's presentation. And here, these two flaps here are going to open next. So they open and broaden out to become a writing surface, lined as they very often were with velvet in the 18th century. Most writing surfaces were resurfaced in the 19th century and later with leather, but in the 18th century and before, in the late 17th century, they were frequently lined with velvet. And as a tactile a textile, the quality of writing, or indeed leaning a precious leather binding onto a velvet surface, was rather different than onto leather. 
Then you can raise it up to become a reading stand, and again, that velvet protects the binding very carefully. And then here you have the right side of that central compartment where you can pull out, again, signal by a piece of brass that invites you to touch it, this very, very narrow long drawer. And then inside, and I'm just going to let this unfold for you, you're going to see the spaces for the writing utensils and the little drawers unravel themselves and the candle stands to the side. And one of the questions I'd like to suggest might be interesting to think about is, is one that sits in a kind of equation, if you like, with the skill levels that Röntgen is so clearly expressing in his furniture. So Wolfram's talk was very clearly showing us what, what, what he could do, what Abraham and David could do. But I'd like you to think now to the user of these pieces and what they could do too, not only in their learning to write and to read, but in the way that they could open this piece of furniture in a way that now it takes a highly skilled conservator to do for us. And I'd like you also to bear in mind, if you would, a quote um, from Mercier, Louis Sebastien Mercier, who was a rather eloquent commentator on 18th century French culture, who said in the, around 1780, the political scientist could judge private and, pub and public morals by the configuration of locks. The more complicated the locks, the more those peoples are dominated by ruse and artifice. So he was saying in the 1780s that anything like this was symbolic of the kind of culture that was um, preoccupied, if you like, with intrigue and secrecy. But let me step back for a moment and just ask the question, so who did all this reading and writing? So wealthy, literate, and cultivated men. Um, here is a man at his desk with his writing utensils. He's holding his quill to one, hand, one side in his hand, and he's pointing here to a letter on the table. He's surrounded by his learned books and custom-built bookshelves behind him. The poor, however, increasingly wrote in the 18th century. Literacy levels were on the increase, and I think we should bear this in mind, that although somebody like this, in a depiction here by Chardin, was um, not going to be one of Röntgen's clients, she had a table, or a table that could be used for writing, even if, even if it wasn't specifically designed for her. And here, Chardin depicts her as a means of um, talking about the kind of um, morality, if you like, of good, good housekeeping, I think. So she may be keeping her accounts and managing her money and making sure that her household operates efficiently and economically. And of course, we know that, the ro uh, that royalty in 18th century France and indeed Europe were highly literate people. And here, Madame de Pompadour, the maîtresse en titre, which means the official mistress, if you like, of Louis XV, a coveted position in many ways, but not the easiest place to be in 18th century culture. Um, but Madame de Pompadour is here very much depicted, not if you like, as a sexual object or as a maîtresse, a mistress, but as a cultivated woman of letters. And we read that in the portrait extremely explicitly from her fabulous writing desk, all of the apparatus of her learned environment. And of course, we have women who are much less grand than that. And I say that simply because we haven't identified this sitter in a portrait from the Bows. And here I'd just like to point towards the reflective quality of an individual sitter in a portrait sitting with a book or a letter, the internal state in which that person is being depicted, one of um, privacy one of quiet thought, of reflection. And these portraits are a bit of a trope for 18th century Europe. Um, and they're, interest, they're interesting in the sense that they offer us a little bit of a paradox, because what the portrait painter is doing is depicting the sitter in what ought to be a very private act, a quiet um, place. But of course, through painting the portrait and by engaging the gaze of that sitter, the portrait painter makes that private act rather more public. So I think as a genre of painting with these kinds of props, rather than playing snap, oh, that's the desk in X collection, we might think a little bit more reflectively ourselves about what these portraits might be about. And I want to point out, too, that it's not just a solitary exercise to sit and read or write, that it might also be a collective experience, a shared experience, as in this reading um, in a painting by the Trois of Molière. And here's another where um, the 
Premier Ministre, the First Minister of France, the Duc de Choiseul, about whom I'm going to speak much more length in a few moments, is being read to by his mistress with a friend in attendance just here. There are other people involved in reading and writing, and this is rather crucial and always gets left out of the stories. And again, these are not clients of Röntgen's desks, but let's consider just for a moment the practice of business and commerce and how essential bookkeeping was. So reading and writing and a little bit of maths went a very, very long way in running a, sex, a successful business. Um, so training people to write and to bookkeep was an important um, part of 18th century French artisanal life, if you like. And here you can see a merchant um, rather well dressed with his obvious um, piles of money at his foot with a rather handsome bureau plat, a, piece, a kind of piece of furniture that Röntgen never made incidentally, but which was absolutely central um, in 18th century France. And at the end, a set of filing um, spaces, which we'll talk about again at length a bit later. The whole operation of commerce, of course, being moderated by the clock. The clock is governing everything. Um, how much time, you know, the time money equation is often invoked in depictions of people doing business, um, but also in other kinds of interiors in 18th century France. And then we have a very, very rare portrait that's just recently passed through the market, and it's in horrible condition, as you can see, but it's a rather rare portrait of a man from Perpignan called um, Tramel, who was a notaire, a notary public. And of course, they had to be highly literate to conduct the business of legal documentation. Um, and here you see him with his bound volumes behind him. So I use these examples just to signal to you that the cultural practice of writing is both what we expect it might to have been, but perhaps was a broader practice um, than we might first have thought. And I want to move now to the question of how was writing taught and how was writing learned for all these different kinds of individuals. <clears throat> we might say that it was um, a rather precise art, um, certainly a learned process, and possibly a form of drawing. And there were considerable debates in the 18th century, actually, about what writing was and what it should be, and what the difference was between the art of writing and the art of drawing and ornamentation. And some fairly fierce debates are quite well documented. Here is the um, script um, à la ronde, um, which is one of the cursive scripts used in 18th century France. And again, there were somewhat ideological battles over which kind of script should be used again printed in various treaties and documents right the way through the 18th century and into the early 19th century. And here you can see the classic joined up version and the separated characters and the capital characters here um, in a treatise, um, sorry, in the Encyclopedia of Diderot and d'Alembert, which was a series of volumes published in the third quarter of the 18th century. Now writing was taught by a maître écrivain, a master scribe. There was a whole guild of writers in 18th century Paris. And the most experienced and expert of those were highly vocal, published extensively, and made rather a lot of money out of teaching the practice of writing. The guild had as a motto, vive la plume, la plume being the quill. Um, and this man, Rossignol, whose um, um, treatise this page comes from, um, was said by people to have painted his characters, that he was a real painter when he drew his characters. And this is from a book called La Decrire, The Art of Writing, that was published in 1745. And what I very much like about it is the depiction at the bottom, which is rather a rare one, of a bureau plat, a flat-topped desk, um, with four pupils sitting with the master écrivain, the master scribe, teaching them all how to write. And what he's doing here in this frontispiece is talking about the véritable posture, the correct posture for writing. And here we bring our furniture designers into rather an interesting um, area of expertise, if you like, which is one of ergonomics. It was utterly critical that you sat at the right angle to your desk, and it depended on whether you were male or female, that right angle. And you had to hold your quill at a certain angle, and your apparatus, whether it was the desktop apparatus or the furniture itself, had to conform to these rules. 
Now, here in the Met, I had a very exciting morning on um, Friday because I had the privilege of working in the drawings and prints department, just seeing what you had here in New York um, in this collection to do with the art of writing. And I came across this rather interesting manuscript of 1807 um, by Bédichis, um, a master writer, a maître écrivain, who published um, a manuscript discussion about the art of writing and its greatest proponents since the early 18th century. And what he had glued into this is this rather beautiful um, ticket, almost, in, in the front of the book, which says, writing is the art of all arts. And I thought that rather summed it up. And one of the things that he says at the bottom of this little um, pair of rhyming um, lines is that writing stabilizes words, rend la parole stable, and paints it in front of our very eyes. And I thought that was rather a, a beautiful concept. And also in the Met, you have this rather interesting treatise um, published by Dautrep. Um, in 1759, also in the drawings and prints department. He was a master scribe who became a master in 1734. And he offers in his frontispiece a printed version which follows all the conventions of the print trade of 18th century book, book printing Paris with this extremely decorated version in which he writes his name here, Dautrep, and it sort of spirals off here um, in an extraordinary way. So essentially, this is a repeat of the upper text over there. I know which one I prefer. Now, going back to the Encyclopedia of Diderot and d'Alembert, um, I want to return to the question of how you sit as a man and how you sit in, as a woman in 18th century Paris, and um, how all of these prescribed um, issues, if you like, of comportment get played out in that book. Now, here you can see a man sitting at his desk in a relatively casual position. And the author, Payasson, another maître écrivain, another master scribe in Paris, the author of the entry in the Encyclopedia on Writing, says that you have three things that make for good writing. The first is a beautiful day. And you can see that just as our advisors at the v and and I'm sure here, and with you all as well, t tell us that the side light is really important, natural light coming from the side, so we don't glare our screens. Well, it was the same in 1760. So you need to have a beautiful day, and what he really means then is good light, I think. Then you need to have a solid table, just here, and the last thing that you need is a comfortable chair, and I'm going to unravel some of those those three things as I work through the next few slides. So here he is in detail, and you can see that um, this man who has depicted the posture of our friend here, who's showing us how writing should be done, has formed not quite a grid, but a series of four lines within which the body must fit. The body must be positioned within this sort of a grid. And the angle of the body to the table is measurable and mathematical, as is the angle of the, of the quill here. Um, and the position of the leg over the front of the chair is critical. And I'm going to show you in a few moments some slides of chairs particularly designed for writing. I'd like you just to remember that. The weight of the body is on the left elbow. And the height of the chair and of the desk must be correct to support the elbows as the weight is distributed from the trunk of the body forward onto the desk. Um, you hold the quill in your right hand, as he does, and you just steady the paper with your left hand, and the quill must be held four to five finger widths distant from the body. So this is a very mathematical situation. And I see some parallels here with the mathematics of Röntgen's thinking as he designs his three-dimensional spaces. And this other related world in which the mathematics and proportions of the body and of the character as, as they are formed, um, have, there's some relationship, I think, between the two. And I would say here that we're talking about some form of early modern ergonom ergonomics. Now here you've got the posture de la main and of the canif. So this is where you've got the um, hands holding the knife that sharpens the quill. And the posture, the physical arrangements of those, are also very, very carefully um, pres prescribed in the encyclopedic entry. And you can see here that you go through different kinds of quill cutting, cutting of the tips, 
depending on what kind of characters you're, what style of characters you're going to form, à la ronde, à l'italienne, à la française, and there are many more. Now, the woman, you may immediately notice, is sitting in a rather different position. Her leg is not forward. Her feet are sitting in this grid, again, with four lines, in absolutely straight on, as I'm standing here with the lectern here. So she's being asked to comport herself in a very, very different way. She still has her beautiful day, and she has her pen and her quill and her table and her chair, but she's constrained to sit directly in front of her furniture. Um, she's, her body is not to bow forwards. Her neck is to remain straight and long. She's not to collapse over her desk. Very, very important that the line of her neck and her shoulders remains under control. So the constraints on her are rather different ones, and these are conventions for women. As they do their toilette as well at their dressing tables, they had to be very careful as they orchestrated the instruments for putting on their makeup effectively, la toilette, um, not to incline the neck too far forward or to, or to do anything with this particularly beautiful line that people rather aestheticized, even fetishized in the second half of the 18th century particularly. The body is not to be close to the desk and it certainly must not touch the desk. That would be quite inappropriate. And the thing to remember, of course, is that she's constrained by whalebone corsets and her pannier. And here is the pannier here on a model. And what you're seeing on the left, some of you may remember if you're devotees of this museum, because this was one of the installations in the Dangerous Liaisons. I know my colleagues down here will remember that moment extremely well. Um, so women have a very different experience of writing than men, and this is very, very clearly articulated in the encyclopedias. Now, the question I want to move on to now was what all this reading and writing was really for. And we might say that it was about cultural participation, that reading and writing is about sharing and communicating. We've seen that it might be about household accounting and running a tight ship at home. It might well be about business and commerce. And if you think about France and its trade with its colonies, um, you're going to see vast amounts of written words being exchanged right across those domains and absolutely reliant on that. It might be, as with the notary public, a question of keeping legal documentation um, in good shape and following all the conventions. Every notary's document in the Archive Nationale in Paris, in the notary's um, archive there, is done in a very, very similar script. There's a convention. The same words introduce every document. The first two or three lines are identical. But the other thing I want to think about a little bit is the way in which the desk and the writing equipment and the practice of writing absolutely underpins the early modern bureaucracy. The desk is the instrument, if anything is, in a material sense, of furniture. The, it, it's absolutely integral to the growing early modern bureaucracy. What you did in 18th century Paris was you bought offices and you paid out a great deal of money to become a secretaire du roi or some other kind of office holder, minor or major. And if you'd bought the office of something like a secretaire du roi, which means a secretary to the king, where well, you weren't actually a secretary to the king, you just paid money and had a form of title, your children then had the chance to become ennobled. So it's a highly strategic thing in 18th century France to buy an office, to become an office holder, to pay out that money and to have then with that office often the chance of bringing in a little bit more money yourself, but also to ennoble your family over time. And the early modern bureaucracy and indeed the the political infrastructure, if you like, of 18th century France and its domains relied utterly on the practice of writing. And all that writing was done on various kinds of desks. Now, what I want to do now is to go back and meet our friend, the Duc de Choiseul, whose um, passionate love um, for his reading friend we saw a little bit earlier. Um, he had a fa fabulous career as Premier Ministre of France, of First Minister of France, until he fell spectacularly from grace in 1770. But that's a story I'm not going to go into. I want to look at him as a character um, who, in his Hôtel de Choiseul in Paris, had very, a rather interesting array of desks, um, which show us some rather interesting things. Here he is in a fabulous portrait. And here he is over here 
in one of the rather elaborate rooms in the Hotel Choiseul. And I should say that this box, I think, is in New York at this very moment, in that it's in a part of the Rothschild family in a private collection and is an extraordinary little gold box with miniatures by Van Blarenberg um, showing um, every detail of this man's interior life. And you're seeing it so huge on the screen, but this box is this big. It's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. So you're seeing it on a scale that very few people will see it on, and it still just about stands up. I know it's slightly overblown. And what I want to do here is to propose to you that there's a form of desk that we've lost, and this is the multi-user desk. You have a family of people working around this desk. You have the Duke, and you have his scribes. So here these people are. Inevitably, they will have been trained by the master scribes that we met earlier. And we have perhaps his secretaire, or this may be his secretaire. We have a long case clock and a wall clock here, but there's also a clock on the desk. This man's work as First Minister of France, for which he was absolutely famous um, at being very good at, very organized. Um, for it, for his classification of his documents was apparently something to behold. Um, and here we have, with this extraordinary desk, wider and longer than the average by far, a whole group of people conducting the business of politics. He worked apparently almost 24 hours a day, um, and every single room depicted on this box, on the top, the inside, and the uh, back and the front, all have a different form of desk. I'm only going to show you two today, otherwise we'll be here until this evening. Um, it's a fantastic desk, and just note here, an open filing system. So the development on these French desks is one towards having open filing systems built at one end of the piece. Now, this is in another Rothschild question, uh, collection that's very hard to get into. This desk was published, and I would absolutely dearly love to see it. It's in Europe. It's the most extraordinary thing. So the desk survives. It went from Choiseul to Talleyrand, so it has an interesting provenance. And there are extraordinary things about it like this, the way that the metalwork just carries the desk in this almost Baroque leap onto its front legs. And you can see that it's absolutely elaborate in its gilt brass mountings. And here's the house for the clock at the top. So it's quite a piece of furniture. Here's another room, the octagonal room in the Hotel Choiseul, um, on another panel on the desk. And here you can see a different form of desk in that it's shorter than the first one. It's still wide, and there are two chairs. Do you see there's a chair on that side and a chair on this side? And here he is standing with something that he's reading in front of his fireplace. Now that desk survives too, and it's, it's at Chantilly, just outside Paris the one with the fabulous racing stables. Um, and this desk is still there. It's by a man called Simon Urban, and actually he's got quite Röntgen-like um, decoration to the legs here. And this is a desk with drawers on, on the sides here, and here's um, a lockable door on the side, and then open filing cabinets here, and the superstructure here rising up to the clock. So it's a highly integrated piece of furniture. It's a highly organized piece of furniture, and it grows out of what, if you like, human beings were doing as they were writing and then classifying their documents. It's a somewhat administrative piece of furniture. Now, having looked at that for a moment, I want to turn back to the question of love and intrigue, which is a question we could consider for some hours once we got going, but we'll try to be brief. And I want to bring back to you this rather wonderful Fragonard from this collection again. And to think a little bit about writing as a process of conducting affairs of love, but also affairs of friendship, of communications between family members, sisters, friends. And of course, if you were um, a respectable 18th century French person, you would at some point in your life probably conduct at least one illicit affair, at least one. Um, and you, what you would do is you would keep the letters that had been written to you and your lover would keep the others. So it was extremely important that you found somewhere very safe to put them. So I want to dwell on this just for a few moments. What you can see in this portrait is a pupitre, a little desk on a desk, if you like. In fact, she has a table. I don't think she's got drawers in this. She's leaning forward. I don't know whether she was reading when her posy of flowers came, but look at the way that the posy of flowers reflects the colors of her toilette. And it, 
makes me think a little bit about the relationship of, if you like, the artifice of writing and the artifice of la toilette as they get embedded together in tables like that one I started with by Röntgen, by Abraham Röntgen, which is a combined writing and dressing table. It's quite important if you're an 18th century lady with a busy love life to have um, a desk in pretty much every room, if not more than one, because when the post comes or the delivery boy comes with your posy or your letter, you need to immediately while keeping him waiting, of course, pen a quick reply. So it's quite a spontaneous system in an 18th century French household um, of letters coming in, and if you have the privacy, you'll return a response by the return of this messenger. Um, so that's one of the explanations for why there are so many writing desks in a house, and often it's one in every room. Now, there's an awful lot of st at stake, as you might imagine, when you've got a desk full of love letters. And very, very clearly, you need to rely very, very heavily on your servants and on your household staff. And these relationships were not always those of trust. Um, the householder would often sleep with the female maid servants. The female maid servants had to be separated from the male servants in the household. The sleeping arrangements had to be monitored and policed. If you didn't pay your staff enough, plus ça change, they might not be quite as loyal to you as you hoped. And there are stories, rather wonderful and spectacular stories, in, um, um, in various books in, in, in the 18th century of great betrayals of a maidservant sneaking the key of a woman's desk to her husband. So it's all rather difficult stuff. And here's another image that shows you what happens if you're not in charge of the locking hardware in your home. Um, this woman is very close to the edge, and I think this man is, uh, with his reach to his bolt, able to keep her exactly where he wants to. Now, you've seen with Rolf Ram's lecture some fabulous desk furniture, and you've seen the way that this material unfolds um, and the way that um, Röntgen, perhaps especially, but there are bakers in Paris that one can think of as well, often from Germany, have a really mathematical sense of how to use space. If you're going to hide a love letter, you don't want anyone to immediately realise that it's there. And I just want to talk you through this box that I've rather fallen in love with in the V&A, having catalogued it in great detail for the, the book that I'm working on. Um, because to start off with, it's relatively unassuming. The marketry is fine, but it's not superlative. It's not as smart as Röntgen's marketry. It's perfectly competent. It's not marked. It stands on its little feet, which may or may not be original. It has a very plain little brass escutcheon there to protect the keyhole, and it has little handles here. But as you unfold it, it becomes a little bit more interesting. So the first thing that happens is that you open it up, and you see three tambours. You remember Röntgen, David Röntgen had that um, wonderful, wonderful backgammon desk that Wolfram showed us with the tambours on the side. Well, here we've got tambours covering three compartments. So here, at the bottom, we think we're seeing the bottom of the desk. Here, if it were closed up, we would think we were seeing the lining to, sorry, not the desk, the box, the lining to the box. But in fact, if you twiddle that fairly, in a fairly agitated manner, this will release and it will fall forward. And it's a very convenient space for putting a good little sheaf of, of letters behind. So we think at this point that we've probably unraveled the internal mysteries of the piece because we found the secret compartment. So if we're the husband um, and we're harboring some suspicions about the look on our wives' faces these days, we might just think that we've sorted that one out. We found the secret compartment. But if you were good at reading the mathematics of furniture and box construction, as I think 18th century people were, you might register that these compartments behind the tambours are rather shallow. Here they are. It's a faux fond, it's a false bottom. And underneath this bottom, behind the tambours, which are all pulled back here, you see on the left side a secret compartment, a drawer that runs in underneath the false bottom and can be used for storing interesting and secret things. And there's a fantastic story that I've talked about often in lectures um, about secrecy and security, which is another bugbear of mine that I'm rather interested in, about a man called Monsieur Custine. And he looked in his wife's um, box, writing box, and he said, I knew by its depth it had to have a false bottom. And goes on to say, I touched the spring. He found the secret spring. And, of course, the secret drawer released. There's a secret spring inside the box here, which you can't see. And poor old Monsieur Custine discovered the most passionate letters written to his wife by his very own brother. 
Now, if you went around, now you see, you might think again that you've discovered the innards of this box, that you'd done your job, that you were just about there. But if you were to open, go and have a look at the right side of the box, which of course has a marquetry panel, just like the other three sides of the box, if you were to lift that marquetry panel out of the grooves in the inside of these faces here, you would see that there's a secret drawer in the bottom on the right-hand side as well with a little recessed ring handle, which is not the original. You can see that is the fixing for the original. So you have, in a box that's really only about that big, quite um, a story, if you like, of secrecy and subterfuge. Now, one of the questions I've been thinking about a lot, which Röntgen's Furniture speaks to so brilliantly, is the question of how cultural activities, and of course here I'm talking about reading to some extent, but writing especially, shaped furniture, and how furniture shaped the activity. And by furniture, I'm including boxes and, and these kinds of things as well. And I think this is a really important question because there's something about late 18th century Europe, and especially Paris, I think, um, but perhaps Wolfram would say it was true of the German courts and perhaps of Catherine the Great's court, that those, those cultures have um, an exceptional capacity for secrecy and intrigue and for the performance of life, if you like. It's very, very sophisticated, and I think you might not always argue that furniture shapes what we do as much as what we do shapes the furniture. Perhaps we would. But I think in this period, with these kinds of objects, that equation works really, really well. So what I want to do now is to go back to our Duke of Choiseul and his busy, busy life in his private residence in Paris with all of those desks, and particularly to think about the multi-user -use desk and how his scribes and his secretary were filing his document, taking dictation, keeping the business of, of politics going, and to look at the kinds of forms that come out of, of, of those practices. So this is where I would say that what people did shaped furniture design very, very clearly in late 18th century Paris. So one thing you could do, um, as happens here on a desk in the Huntingdon collection, is to have three drawers in a very handsome neoclassical desk of the 1760s on one side, and to make the case quite wide, wider than usual, this is probably about this wide, and it's not a very big desk, and to have three drawers on the other side too. So two people can work facing each other, and each has a set of drawers, six drawers in total. So that's one furniture form that comes out of this practice of writing or working collectively. And this is, it's so interesting that this has been lost. It's, I think, entirely due to the tradition of collecting furniture in the 19th century, where a beautiful piece of 18th century French furniture, or indeed German furniture, might be collected for, sing for a single collector's use, if they used it at all. So that sense that these were used for multiple functions rather disappears. So here's another version, and I'm sorry these are in black and white, they're very old um, images of pieces that have rather disappeared. This is rather clever because it's a desk that would fold away to that side, but if you had an extra need occasionally, perhaps not primarily, to have your scribe or secretary sit down with you, you could pull a second tier out completely. It's called a table à coulisse, so you pull it forward, and in that you've got three lockable drawers. And then the other possibility is that you've got something rather like this French, um, French made desk in the Wadston collections in England, where you've got these filing cabinets at the top, you've got the clock just as we've seen, and on the side you've got your three drawers here. But if you look at this diagram and this unfolded version of the desk, you see that it's got a lot more features. And what's very clever about the way the cabinet maker Reasoner has designed this desk is that once you pull this forward, it comes to the same level and settles as a flat surface. And that's much cleverer than this one, which won't do that. So the various cabinet-making responses to this, and the most interesting one, um, which doesn't survive, is an image from a 1770s treatise on furniture making, where you've got a six-user desk built as one unit. So here's the elevation of the desk. This is a closed, angled flap. Here it's open. The administrator who's working in a big office has his pigeonholes, or her pigeonholes, but probably his pigeonholes. Um, you can see here something of the internal configuration and mathematics of these openings. And here we've got a bird's eye view down onto the desk. So here you can see one space closed, another 
here open um, as we go around the desk. And here you can see that the triangular corners fold away to close it up at that point, but unfold as here to make a flat surface. And this is very interesting when you look at someone like the Duc de Choiseul, because his Department of um, Internal Affairs and Foreign Affairs in um, the 1760s, in new buildings built outside the Chateau de Versailles, were apparently fitted out with fabulously well-designed wooden furniture, which I would love to get in and have a look at. They have some remnants of it still there, apparently, um, in which you've got these very systematic bureaucratic pieces of furniture designed with filing systems built into the walls, labelled, you know, here are the affairs of France, here are the affairs of this colony, that colony, this region, that region. So there's another kind of furniture here that's completely lost, really, to us, and which really isn't collected or collectible. Now, I promised earlier to talk a little bit about chairs, and I want to show you what happens to chair design when you put a chair in front of a desk. And you may remember that our man, who was writing in the encyclopedic reproduction, um, was sitting with his, front leg, uh, with his left leg forward over the front of the chair. Now, most of us at home sit on chairs with legs at all four corners, whatever the shape of the chair seat or the set chair back. There is a structural, uh, there is an assumption that we make that we sit on a chair with four legs at each corner, one leg at each corner. This chair is completely different because it has one leg at the front, one leg at the back, and two set rather back from the sides there, somewhere where your skirt would go if you were wearing a skirt with a pannier. This is from um, a treatise on cabinet making of the early 1770s, the same one as the big piece of furniture with the six openings comes from. Now, this is all because of posture. You needed to sit forward on your chair to write. To get your left elbow down, you needed to shift the weight of the body over the piece of furniture. So you needed your furniture to be very strong, and it needed your front loading the weight effectively and ergonomically, and so this shape at the front allows for the body to come forward, the leg to come over the leg of the piece of furniture. And the seat itself is quite shallow and in a tub form, as you can see, so that it can support your back. It's much more shallow than a regular 18th, 18th century chair would be. Some of the really comfortable chairs, as in the Moliere painting that I showed you earlier, are quite deep. Um, and you sink quite a lot way back to them. This is a working chair. Here's a fabulous one at the Getty, which um, this is a view down onto this, where you've got these little secret flaps even in the chair, which I rather covet. Um, but you can see, oh, I'm sorry, you can see here, let me go back to that one, you can see here that it's a shallow chair seat. It comes way forward at the front, it scoops in here and here, and you're very well supported at the front structurally. So it's a rather different animal, and it does the job of supporting the writing body absolutely brilliant, brilliantly. And you've got here the rotating, swiveling chairs um, that Wolfram talked about. On the left, you've got a French one with giltwood decoration. And I should have said that the seats are often upholstered in leather rather than in silk. Um, again, for good hard wearing um, capacity. And here you've got this really fabulous one from Chatsworth, which is a really rare, it's a rare opportunity for you to see that Chatsworth furniture. It's a fabulous um, loan to have secured. And this chair is done in marquetry in, with true Röntgen finesse inlaid with gilt brass decoration. So it's a very sophisticated piece of furniture. Um, and it swivels here. These two chairs swivel at that point there. Now, another piece of specialist furniture is the full-sized cartonnier, the full-sized um, filing system. And this started, as you saw on Choiseul's desks, with open shelving. This was the great innovation of the slightly earlier part of the 18th century, where you would put a gradin, as it was called, a set of open shelves onto your desk, and it would, it would give you a lot more space than the drawers offer. The drawers, of course, are lockable, which is a big advantage. Um, but you would run out of filing space fairly quickly. And the Minister of Affairs and of Domestic Affairs that I was talking about earlier, where they had all these bureaucratic pieces of furniture, had walls lined with um, different kinds of filing systems with the boxes all labelled. Now, each of these boxes comes out. I, we might call it now an archive box um, or a document box. Um, these are leather-fronted. Often the boxes themselves are made of something called carton, which is like a um, compressed paper, almost like paper mache, but rather more rigid. Um, so they're not wooden drawers, they're not really drawers, they're boxes, and you can take them out, put them on the desk, sort out your documents and put them away. And the great thing about this one is that it's lockable. 
um, they weren't on the desk that I showed you earlier. So here you've got, this is the side closed with this strip of wood over the side edges of the document boxes. And here it's open and hinged here, here and here. And it locks as you fold it over onto the front so you couldn't pull one of those document boxes out. And you can see here gilded the names of all the subjects of the documents that would be classified within. So labelling, sequencing, securing your paperwork becomes something of an art in the 18th century, and the furniture makers really support that. So let's go to Schwarzel a minute. And um, I would say that these kinds of objects particularly clearly show that furniture designers knew the business of their clients intimately. There's a very close relationship mentally between how Röntgen designed and how his customers were going to consume things. Some of the furniture, of course, was custom made. And as Wolfram said, a lot of it, if not all of it, came with a manual, an instruction manual. Um, and um, the point that I'd like to move on to, having thought about that one, is the question of whether or not 18th century French uh, furniture and Röntgen's furniture specifically whether or not it actually starts to embody the human activity at a level that we haven't really thought about, I think, as decorative arts historians before. And we've talked about the secretaire, the secretary, whether it's the secretary to the king, he had many, the secretary to the first minister, Choiseul, or the secretary to a regular household. Now, the term secretaire, the man who does the business of household accounting, who is the scribe for his master, who probably looks after the key to the furniture when the master's away, so really is the holder of the master's um, knowledge and business and secrets. The, the term secretaire, of course, has at its core secret, secret. The secretaire is a secret keeper. Uh, in Harry Potter terms, probably, as much as 18th century French ones. So the secretaire is a form of furniture, named as it was, presumably relates somewhat to the function of the secretary, the man who was the secretaire, and behind him, the notion of the secret. And I want to look now for a few moments at the form of the secretaire and show you one by Röntgen that we have um, in the V&A. Now, this is a secretaire open, and you can see here, here are the archive boxes, very similar in blue and white. And here is the woman pointing to her books with her child at her side. The secretaire as a form of furniture becomes a very personal piece of furniture. All of the filing systems are set behind solid lockable panels and the furniture goes back here to being a single user piece. It becomes private, it can be secret. It's not about multiple use at all, as far as I understand it. The household employees are kept out of the picture. Um, and here, this woman, and in other cases, um, I can show you a detail here, the men who use these pieces of furniture have total control over their environment. And the secretaire, as a piece of furniture, allows them to perform some of the functions of an assistant by being so well designed and offering them and accommodating all, all these different kinds of documentary needs. It is, I think, the 18th century single user workstation um, of, of all furniture types. It's ready-made with its fold-down writing surfaces. It's got compartments for ink, it's sand pot, um, for drying the ink, places to store the quills, places to put books, document boxes, um, and as I said earlier, some of the leather surfaces will originally have been of velvet. Here you may well have a blue velvet here. And here's another example where we don't actually see the secretaire, but what we do see with this rather busy man with his um, array of um, letters on his uh, 18th century pin board, lots of document boxes all around the place. And I wonder whether he's a man of letters or a man of some kind of commerce. This is the V&A's commode by David Röntgen, a rather wonderful piece. Um, and I wanted to give you, if you like, a guided tour of this to see how this secretaire form works. This is the forefront, and the keyhole is here. There's a keyhole here for the top drawer that opens independently, and there's another one down here to open the two doors at the bottom that enclose a cupboard. So over here, we have an interesting screen here, which is rather beautiful. Um, at the centre of the open boxes here and here, and the closed... Um, draw fronts here. 
And this is Röntgen's most fabulous stained wood marquetry um, screen. You draw that back, it's, on a tam it's a tambour mechanism, and then you get access to that interior space. And if you look into the base of the thing just here, um, you find that there are document boxes in the bottom. And if you pull them forward, you lift this panel up and this drawer springs. So you have a false bottom again here. And if you take the whole unit out, you can see rather better that you take this up and this lower drawer springs out. These are the metal springs in the interior. Now, I would like to propose that this is all rather about disguising. Röntgen was a master of disguise, I would say, and so was this man, the spy, the Chevalier Deon. Um, this portrait was long thought to be a female sitter, and when being cleaned, um, when it came onto the market earlier on this year in London, it was discovered that it was a male spy, in fact, the Chevalier Deon, who was part of a spy network called the Secret du Roi of Louis XV. He was a cross-dressing spy of the 18th century. He was exiled um, for betraying the king. He returned only on the condition to France that he dressed as a woman. So this is a rather interesting moment where the affairs of politics and sexuality merge very beautifully. But I show you the image in part because I want you to think about the question of how we disguise points of entry and exit in pieces of furniture as much as buildings and how... Um, furniture can, can delude us somewhat. So in the v &A, we have a piece of furniture with three drawers on the front. Um, it is what it says it is, basically. Um, here in the Gettys version, you've got apparently three drawers, but if you press um, a little button, a fourth and a fifth drawer will jump forward hidden behind this decoration that looks as though it just frames the inside of the main drawers. So I don't have time to go into this in any great depth today, but this question of secrets and keyholes being disguised and um, quite cleverly arranged is, uh, I think, a profitable one. So here we have the Duc de Choiseul with his desk, and I think we start to think of his desk and his environment um, as a more complex one as a result of some of these themes and of this desk, the Chanty desk as being the ultimate piece, if you like, of bureaucratic furniture. And I want to close with a few, just a few more slides in which I want to look at the question of the embodiment of some of the functions of filing into an even newer form of furniture than this. And just like Wolfram, I want to close really with the Gettys desk here, where we have a cylinder mechanism here that encloses what was originally much more open in the earlier forms of desks. So there's this constant re-evaluating of what needs to be internalized and externalized, accessible or lockable in these pieces of furniture. Unless you worried about those servants that I mentioned earlier, on this combined jewel casket and secretaire in the v &A, these little drawers on the side that uh, have the um, ink pot and the quills and the sand pot inside are released by pressing a button underneath. So you don't, as the person who's going to come and replenish the writing equipment, need to have the key to the furniture. They spring out, as our visitors frequently demonstrate, when you press the button on the underside. So coming back to this, I think one of the questions then is what kind of skill levels we have. How do we arrive at this point from the closed piece of furniture here. That requires a great deal of physical interaction between the owner of the furniture um, and the furniture itself. So here it is open again. And the point that I want to, to explore here is the one of touch. Art historians talk constantly about sight. Doesn't work for the decorative arts, as any of you who like handling things will know. It's all about touch, but it's not only about touch, it's about feeling. So it's not just about touching a hard surface, it's about feeling the difference between the velvet and the marquetry, between the cold metal and the warm wood and the soft textile. Um, and it's about, I think, ultimately, the question of whether or not the furniture talks back. And I think that Röntgen's furniture talks back to you. And I think it's pretty extraordinary for that. This is a piece in the v &A that we're showing in the exhibition with the back off, so I hope you have a chance to look at it. Um, from the outside, you can see that the marquetry depicts some, um, with some perspective, a sense of space in the picture 
the marquetry picture panel by panel. And this completely disguises, to my mind, the interior very mathematical structure, the kind of thing that you're used to now as you look at Röntgen furniture. And if you flip that little disc at the center, you just shift it slightly to one side, it flips open and it reveals the keyhole. And then you get immediately a sense of the furniture talking back, because what you can feel when you handle Röntgen's furniture and some French pieces, a fair number of good French pieces, is the sense that the springs of steel that sit behind the facade are giving a kind of feedback mechanism to you that seems to me very, very distinctive. So to get into this piece of furniture and to make it do this, this is the back, sorry, this is, this is the lead weights on the back. It's all run with lead weights and gravity, basically. It's very cleverly done. There's a very good piece in the catalogue of the exhibition about this. So if we then come to this and put the key in, you can put the key in upside down or the right way up, and each turn will do something different. One of them will open this. If you then push the key a little harder, you'll push the springs away from you and get the key a little bit further in, and you can turn it again to the left or the right. And as you do it, the physical experience of working the furniture is that the furniture is resisting you. The spring mechanisms, with the, because of the properties of steel, which brass doesn't have, inside this it's all steel, all the springs are of steel. And the 18th century metalworking trades knew this very well, and particularly in Germany and England, actually, not so much in France. What you feel is the piece of furniture talking back to you. And you get to know with a piece of furniture like this that I've known and loved for 20 years now, whether on a cold day it will open differently than on a warm day, whether the humidity will alter its responsiveness. The centre section of this has been stuck for about 10 years. We can't get it open at all. When we put it in our new galleries, we'll be able to. But you begin to realise when you get to know the furniture when cons conservation needs to come and help you with it and whether it's just acting up because it's a muggy day outside. You, you know in the 18th century whether or not you need to call Mr. Röntgen or one of the local um, people in Paris in to come and service your furniture or to recondition it. And I think there's an analogy to be made, and this is my very final point, between this kind of touch technology, this kind of sensing of furniture and of relating to furniture that is very personal, and this kind of technology that we always use happily today, where nowadays we're using touch screens that were designed to change our behavior, but in, in, in this instance, our behavior is now changing the technology. And we've just done some really interesting audience research at the VNA for our new gallery of furniture, in which every time we showed a visitor a screen, the visitor touched it. They, no, people don't look at screens anymore. They reach out and touch it, and they know that they will feel a little resistance, as just as you do on a keyboard or on your iPhones, that you will feel a little bit of feedback going on with that technology and you will feel your way to search for your information and to use um, your technology. And I think historians have to be very careful about making analogies between the past and our present technologies, but it seems to me that it does help us think about the extraordinary qualities of Röntgen's furniture and its owner's experiences. Thank you very much.